television as we know it is in a bit of a free fall. Television is a crapshoot. It's stressful because what we're buying down here now sets a huge part of our entire broadcast year to come. The content is fantastic. Best shows ever. But the broadcast business? Not for the faint of heart. We use TV maybe 5% of the time, and we use internet nonstop. The world is changing. It's just taking a while for the cable companies to figure out how, where their place is now. It won't completely die, but it's going to take a horrific beating. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald, and if you haven't already cut your cable, this Doc Zone considers a TV renaissance. Do you like to count? It's a teacher. Me too. A babysitter, a best friend in times of need. It keeps us company when we're alone and can be the life of the party. It's influenced our relationships. Bachelor number one. The clothes we wear, what we eat, our famous French fries, how we talk. The JJ. You don't think she'd yada yada sex? I've yada yada sex. It can topple governments and make millionaires overnight. He's won a million dollars! And capture heroic moments. He is being called the hero of the U.S. Airways flight. It can even simulate the real thing. You can love it or you can hate it, but you can't escape it. The average Canadian will tune into more than 100,000 hours of it in a lifetime. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for 12 years. What is it about TV that captures our attention so completely? There was something about the medium that as soon as you turned it on is mesmerizing. Jeff Pavir is a pop culture critic, author, and TV radio personality. Television used to be called the electronic hearth. What that image suggests is that the television replaces the fireplace. It replaces the kind of the center of the domestic experience around which the entire family gathers. TV has been a guest of honor in our living rooms, our bedrooms, and now in our pockets for almost 80 years. Screens seem to be everywhere. TV continues to get lighter, more portable, and more interactive with each passing day. I watch TV on my laptop. I have to be honest, I use my tablet more than anything now. Sometimes on my phone, normally if I'm out somewhere for like a drive or on transit. I have a bath every night, so uh, we put the tablet into a waterproof bag and hang it from the shower. So it's like my own little personal theater in the uh, bathroom. <laughs> it's hard to believe that when TV first came on the scene, Canadians were wary and skeptical of this flickering screen lighting up their living rooms. It was a new experience for people, and people were fascinated by television. John Doyle is an author and television critic for the Globe and Mail. People, especially older people, were sort of unsure of what television was. There were stories that people were slightly afraid to argue in front of the television. You certainly wouldn't, you know, comb your hair or undress or change your clothes in front of the television, just on the off chance that the television was actually watching you uh, as well as you watching the television. By the late 1940s, television took off. American networks were broadcasting their signals, and Canadians living along the U.S. border were tuning in. Three, two, one. This is the CBC Television Network. Then, in 1952, the CBC introduced its fledgling service to the nation. A crowd of millions, undaunted by rain and chill, gathers to witness the crowning of a new British monarch. And with the coronation of Queen Elizabeth in 1953, Canadians were officially hooked and bought more than 85,000 TV sets in anticipation of this royal spectacle. In the beginning, our Canadian programming tended to be quite different from the American shows. It included Shakespearean dramas, panel discussions on Canadian literature, Welcome again to Hidden Pages, science series, public affairs public debates, affairs. and folk singing shows. Not surprisingly, Canadian audiences also craved escapist American programming. I was there for the Andy Griffith Show, and I was there for Bewitched and the Dick Van Dyke Show. Uh, anything that had a kind of a laugh track was worth laughing along with. The Donna Reed Show, or 
a Western like Bat Masterson. Masterson's the name. Bat Masterson. I loved Captain Kangaroo. I think I could probably still hum the song, but I won't. We used to watch Get Smart as a family. Hello, Professor. This is Maxwell Smart, Agent 86 of Control. Yep. Canadians loved to watch American TV. We liked it so much that back in the 60s, even when Canadian channels aired popular American shows, people still preferred to watch those shows on American channels. This translated into lost advertising revenue and ratings for the Canadians. But it wasn't until the early 70s when cable television became popular that the Canadian TV broadcasters successfully lobbied the government to put their own commercials into those American shows. That is what their business model is. That is what they have always done and that is what they want to continue to do. Americans have been happily selling their shows to us for decades. But the business of buying shows from our friends south of the border is definitely a big gamble. The stakes are incredibly high, and one hit or miss can make or break a network season. Every year, the game starts here on the East Coast. Bill Carter, a longtime reporter for the New York Times and author of three books on the subject of television, explains how it all starts. Well, the upfronts are a long-standing tradition here in New York. And basically, they are a ritual where the networks, and now all the cable networks, put on presentations for advertisers. And they show the new shows that they have coming for next season. They call it upfront because they're asking you to put up money up front before the show has been produced. Which, if you think about it, is a crazy idea, right? And that actually works. I mean, as goofy as that sounds, the way I'm describing it, astonishingly, it works. About half the advertising dollars are committed in the upfront process. But the broadcaster only shows them the pilot. They haven't shot the whole series yet. Advertisers must commit millions of dollars based on just one episode and hope for the best. Doesn't this seem a bit risky? It's a very unscientific process. So there's a lot of gut work involved. Mainly what you need is a catcher's mitt. Because the hit is going to fall out of the sky. Don't miss it. That's it. That's really what it comes down to. Because it's so insanely unpredictable. Yes. For every successful show on the air, there are hundreds that bit the dust. And once the U.S. networks place their bets on the slate of shows for the upcoming season, the game then shifts from the East Coast to the West Coast. Right after that, there are screenings in L.A. for the international broadcasters and networks who want to buy American shows. And Canadian TV executives have been coming to Hollywood to find those American shows since 1962. Back then, there were only a handful of them at the annual L.A. screenings. But now, the Canadians share this celebrated TV event with thousands of top-level TV program buyers from 70 countries. And they are all here to screen the American Network's new crop of television pilots. And the studios pull out all the stops. Stars come out in force. The parties are elaborate. Canadian broadcasters are there with their wallets open and their eyes fixed on the screen, hoping to pick the next big hit. It's a hyper-competitive process, and the stakes are sky-high in this annual Hollywood content feeding frenzy. Last year, Canadian broadcasters spent approximately $700 million buying American TV shows to air on our own networks. And the shows aren't even made yet. All this money is gambled based on the strength of a pilot episode. American television is watched worldwide. And every broadcaster in the world is interested in having the opportunity to put some of those American shows on their channel. We're all looking at what the Americans have decided to do and picking from them to help fill out and round out our own schedules uh, for our home audiences. What did you watch last night? Barb Williams is president of Shaw Media, 
which owns such Canadian channels as Global, HGTV, and the Food Network. This is Barb's ninth year at the LA screenings. Canadians are treated differently than the rest of the world, and that's because uh, in Canada, as everybody knows, the American signals come into our country, so you can watch CBS, NBC, ABC in Canada. You can't do that anywhere else in the world. They take special care of us because we're a hugely important buyer for the Americans. It's a secretive affair, cloaked in cutthroat competitive bidding wars. Deals are made behind closed doors, and the winners won't be known until the money is spent and the ratings are in. Bell, Shaw, and Rogers, we are the ones that really are getting that most special treatment. So we screen as a Shaw team alone in a screening room, and CTV is somewhere else doing what they do, and Rogers is somewhere else doing what they do. So you never bump into the other guys, right? You just sort of do your own thing. And yes, then we all stay at separate hotels. It's like we all sort of pretend the other people aren't here and you're just kind of locked in your own game. It's sort of crazy to think that it's stressful to come down to LA and watch a bunch of TV, but it actually is. And it's stressful because um, what we're buying down here now really sets a huge part of our entire broadcast year to come. So what are the new hits going to be this fall? Well, first of all, we're sure they're all going to be on Global. You need to have the shows that will be the, the winners. You need top 10, top 20 shows, because that's where the money is from the advertisers. If you don't get it right now, you really don't have another shot at it in a big way until this time next year. So uh, it, it does really make people a little crazy. <laughs> William's track record for picking hit shows is impressive. We will say to ourselves that if you come home with one new hit, like you might buy, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 new shows, but if you come home with one new hit, you've done it. We have a winning schedule this year for our viewers and for you. Television is one of the craziest businesses around. What people perhaps don't realize is how complicated and how much of a lottery television is. Sometimes you get the winning ticket, most of the time you're not going to win anything. Television is a crapshoot. A crapshoot indeed. Many of the most successful shows of this century were rejected here at the LA screenings by TV execs just like these. And nobody here wants to miss out on the next Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones. These are definitely not the kind of shows that Canadian TV execs from the early 60s would have placed their bets on. What we watch, when we watch, and how we watch has changed. It's fun to think about those good old days where they just watched what we told them to watch when we told them to watch it, but that's just not the game anymore. Back in the good old days, watching TV used to be simple. There were only a few big networks and a handful of channels to pick from. TV was something we came home to. The landscape has shifted, the audience has splintered, television itself has splintered. You no longer have one giant mass audience which is watching three channels and seeing the same commercials. So what's happened to this attentive audience of yesteryear? Well, we could ask the 8 million people who watched Felix Baumgartner skydive from the stratosphere last year. They didn't watch that on television. They watched it on YouTube. Or how about the 6 million people who illegally downloaded the gruesome Red Wedding episode of last season's Game of Thrones? They didn't pay to watch it on HBO. And then there are the 7 million people who tuned in to watch the second season of House of Cards. But when the tit's that big, everybody gets in line. But they watched that on Netflix. Now, with all the technology and the opportunity to watch on demand, viewers can stay with very complicated television. And so it's really raised the bar and up the ante, I think, in the, in the expectation of the viewer, but also in the creative opportunity. TV has moved away from the formulaic half-hour sitcoms and the hour-by-hour -hour procedural dramas. They've taken a back seat, making way for some of the most interesting TV in our history. And we can't seem to get enough of it. If we're going to go home and anesthetize ourselves on TV, it would be nicer if we watch good stuff. 
love, love, love Game of Thrones. I just finished watching Orange is the New Black. Word Black Empire. Breaking Bad. Dexter. True Detective is great. When we come back, the creative revolution that has changed the way we watch TV. Days. Year four. Choices lottery. The national. TV guru experienced a rapid some snow for Friday. Tonight after the national, I'll show you how much snow. See you at 11. Over the last decade, TV has experienced a rapid transformation. Analog TVs with rabbit ears are a thing of the past. We have moved into a new digital world, and it's changed everything. TV guru Robert Tersek is known as the guy who is always ahead of the digital trends in television. He's responsible for bringing video to our cell phones and getting Oprah Winfrey and every other major channel online. He's now one of the most sought after executives in Hollywood. For the first time ever in history, TV has competition in the living room. And what I mean by that is, there used to be only two ways to get TV in your house. You had an antenna, and then you could get over-the-air broadcast TV shows. And if you wanted multi-channel TV, you had to subscribe to a service. Suddenly, we have new ways to get video programming in the living room. I can download content onto my iPhone from Apple. I can buy a, a movie or a TV show or a song, a music video, or I can watch something from YouTube. And then with one touch on my smartphone, I can send it to my Apple TV in my living room. This technology has also harnessed a powerful new kind of storytelling. Brett Martin is the author of Difficult Men, which looks at the emergence of a powerful group of TV producers and creators whose work now seems to outshine even the brightest lights of Hollywood's longtime box office reign. The conversations I was having at parties were no longer about films, they were about television programs. In the air, the, the cultural things you, that you needed to see, the, the stuff that, that you needed to know about, uh, increasingly online and certainly in person, they were on television. It's very difficult now to remember how radical a change that was. Because compared to the big screen box office smash obsessed movie industry, TV had been the underdog for a very long time. TV was very much second rate. It made a lot of money, but it was for whores and sellouts, basically. And there is no agent in Hollywood anywhere who would send their, uh, their client who had worked in um, film, much less an award-winning um, uh, Kevin Spacey or a Glenn Close or a M Matthew McConaughey, uh, anywhere near an audition for a television show. That was just absolutely verboten. Now the biggest movie stars are jumping on the TV bandwagon in droves. And the Oscar goes to Matthew McConaughey. I can't think of another time in history when the guy who was given the Oscar for Best Actor was at that moment on a television show that was running at the same time that the awards were. We're in kind of a golden age for storytelling, and it's a great era to be a successful actor because you can easily migrate from one industry to another or from one platform to another. So why did it take so long for big screen quality to funnel down to the TV watching masses? And why are they eating it up now? If you're looking for a single reason um, for why this was allowed to be, it's that advertising ratings had once been the ultimate god of television. You needed the most number of viewers, and the most number of viewers brought in the most advertising dollars. There was something about this medium that prevented great work from happening there, that really it was about selling soap and putting people to bed comfortably at night. That was the classic formulation of television. I think increasingly one of the things that was a seismic change when something like HBO came on the air was the idea that people watch something uh, because it didn't have advertising in it. In broadcast TV in the United States, commercial broadcasting, we've started to insert more and more and more advertising segments, more breaks, more frequent breaks. 
So we started to write shows in this peculiar staccato fashion where you never linger in one scene for very long. You never really get to spend a lot of time with characters. You have to move the plot forward very quickly so that there's a cliffhanger in three or four minutes so that we can insert yet another commercial. But without those pesky commercials interrupting the flow, a new kind of storytelling started to form. You can have a story arc that extends over a whole season, so suddenly you can start to get into minute detail of a particular relationship that's very important. You can have an incident play out in one show that's not paid off until four episodes later, but it's setting the foundation for something that might have great consequences later in the show. This is a big change in the way we tell stories. If you look at the men I write about in this book, they fell upon this opportunity as though they'd been starving in the wilderness for a decade. So there's something very lovely about that, that when these moments uh, open up, people are ready to, to flood in and, and begin telling stories. And, and as it happened, the audience was also ready and received it more passionately than anybody could have ever expected. It creates a relationship with the viewer, which is it's challenging, but it's also flattering because it's saying, we know you're paying close attention to this. And if you do watch this closely, you will be rewarded. There is something about television that creates a kind of intimacy and a kind of attachment that goes beyond even the way we feel about film or books. It's a discrete kind of artistic experience. You know, we live with these characters. By the time you finish with The Sopranos, you've spent 90 hours. That's more than you spend with a lot of your family members. It's not a surprise that we've come to feel as though we know these people, as though they're part of us. And what do you do after spending so much quality time with such riveting characters? Why, you talk about them, of course, with your friends, your co-workers, and now with the whole world. I don't think it's an accident that you've seen the rise of the internet and the rise of this kind of television side by side because I think they aid and abet each other. There's a kind of communal experience to watching these shows while interacting with them, interacting with your friends that I think uh, we, we hunger for now. Um, you know, if, if I don't watch Mad Men um, on Sunday, I can't go on Twitter, I can't go on Facebook. And that is the equivalent of not being able to go to the water cooler back at home. I can't, um, I am culturally illiterate immediately. You should not be going on social media. You should be avoiding it like the plague because people are going to be talking about it. I think it's kind of rude and I think it's kind of mean because somebody might not be watching at the same time you are and you can still talk about it on Facebook, for instance, without giving away all the good details. You cannot tell millions of people who have seen the show uh, not to talk about the show uh, because it might spoil it for just you. One of the things that the the proliferation of social media has done is it, is it has put even more power and influence in the hands of viewers and fans. Broadcasters will now know instantly whether or not the decision they have made in terms of what a character will do, uh, a story arc taken, they're going to know immediately what fans think of that. When Joffrey died on Game of Thrones, that was a pretty big deal. Everybody was talking about it on social media. You just get so enwrapped in this moment in a show where for season after season after season, this character's been such a jerk to everybody. You just vilely hate this person so much that when he finally dies in the episode, millions of people around the world are all just united in that, like, yes, he's dead. <laughs> so there's this entire realm of discussion and blogging and recapping and tweeting and, and, and commenting that's going on side by side. And I, and I think that's something very unique to the way we, we um, relate to TV. We've learned how to blog, how to tweet, and now, TV has us latched onto yet another compulsive behavior, binge watching. I was homesick with the flu and I watched 12 hours yeah. straight. <laughs> it was so good. I love to binge. I would, I would not like to admit that in public. Sometimes even I'll wait till a whole series is done and then I'll watch it all together just so I get the full effect. I've definitely been known to uh, <laughs> wake up in the morning cuddling my MacBook. You wind up watching 15 episodes of Game of Thrones in a row and you don't sleep very much and you have this Pavlovian response to the theme music every time it starts. It's immersive, it, it's intense. You know, it's like taking a drug in many ways. And who's the biggest purveyor of binge-ready content? Netflix.
Netflix had been around for about a decade as a company that shipped DVDs by mail. So the service was very simple. If you were a movie fan, you really loved to have movies, but you didn't like paying late fees because you left the tape in your machine for a, a week or two and discovered to your dismay when you went to rent another video that you were overdue. Some people got frustrated by that. Netflix was designed to solve that problem. And when Netflix officially put all their content online, you only had to click a button to watch your favorite show. And for less than $10 a month for a seemingly unlimited amount of viewing pleasure, it's no surprise Netflix has accumulated over 50 million subscribers. A service especially tantalizing to that younger generation of TV watchers who rarely opt for that monthly $100 cable bill. And as with any good business, others began to start up their own online TV libraries. Hulu, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Vudu, Google Play, and the list continues to grow. With all this competition, how does a service like Netflix keep 50 million subscribers tuned in? Original programming. Shows like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black have got everybody talking and watching. So here's a service that never had video on television per se, but they were submitting their shows for consideration for a primetime Emmy Award, the premier TV award, and they won. And they've broken the mold in another important way. See, Mark? Unlike traditional networks, Netflix doesn't make pilots. They go for it whole hog, committing to shooting entire seasons. They then release all those episodes at once. Netflix did not have 70 years of network experience, yet they had tremendous success with this unorthodox platform. They have a tremendous amount of consumer information. They know what movies you want to watch next, what TV shows you're interested in. They also know your viewing behavior, so they know which shows you've watched to entirety or through completion, and they know which ones you've abandoned halfway through or early in, so they have a good sense of your preferences. They have algorithms then that can compare people with similar viewing habits and they can start to get an aggregate picture of what a viewer like you might like. All that consumer information also puts Netflix out in front when it comes to helping old shows come back to life. When we come back, we'll talk to the Trailer Park Boys and find out how they're embracing this new digital world. where we keep it. We are but a small part in We could throw at it. For survival. <laughs> TV production in Canada is a $6.5 billion a year industry. It has grown by 100% doubling in size in just 10 years. <laughs> and now, for the first time in history, Canadian shows air in primetime slots in the U.S. The U.S. recession in 2008 had a lot to do with it. American networks had to cut costs but still create hit shows. The solution? Buy lower budget but high quality Canadian dramas. Shows like Flashpoint, The Listener, Motive, they are shows that are made here using Canadian writers, crews, cast, actors, and so on. Well, they're not distinctively Canadian in any way. These are shows that fill time slots. They're cheaply bought and aired. If you happen to be in another country and you watch Flashpoint or The Listener, for all of the merits of those shows, you would have no clue that those are Canadian television shows. Canadians are imitative of the Americans instead of being original. I don't think there have been Canadian ideas that have had nearly the impact as ideas from Israel, which is a much smaller country. The Israelis are doing very original work. They're not imitating the American shows. They're coming up with their own ideas. Does it all boil down to the fact that we are too akin to the Americans? That our culture is so similar that our stories aren't as alluring as others are around the world? We obviously have talent up here in Hollywood North, right? So what's holding us back? Some say the simulcast system. Some say we're risk adverse. 
Some say we don't support our own. We have taken all of your stars <laughs> and made them ours, and you can't have them back, <laughs> and we get credit for them. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of Canadian talent that's come to America, and very many extremely good creative people come out of Canada, and as soon as they get successful, they move to the U.S. So David Shore, who created and produced House, you know, he's working in America. He's not creating shows for Canada. Live from New York, it's Saturday night! Lorne Michaels was a kid in Canada, was enamored of television, came to the United States, has had massive impact on American television. Massive. He's had Saturday Night Live for 40 years. Could he have done that in Canada? It's unlikely. So why can't we keep our talent up here? Is it really all about the money? Lack of opportunity? The energy it brings and the vitality. And Chris Haddock, one of Canada's most famous showrunners, was picked up by Martin Scorsese's Boardwalk Empire. He was also the creative force behind the CBC productions, Da Vinci's Inquest, and Intelligence. We asked him why he left. If you go to Hollywood, you see very clearly that the television and film is a genuine, vast industry. And you see much more opportunity there uh, than you do here. If you're looking around Canada, it's a bit like the CFL. You've only got a couple of teams you can play with, and, and, and then, you know, there's a salary cap, and you're going, okay, maybe after a couple of years, I can make the leap to the NFL. CTV and Global's schedule is made up of imported television, mostly from the U.S. So you'll see on most of the primetime schedules, you'll see uh, U.S. programming and the dinner hour on. So for the private uh, broadcasters, uh, they make their money from uh, selling the advertising, you know, uh, uh, that they have on their schedules. And if they have the big U.S. primetime shows, there's much off-air promotion everywhere in magazines and all other sorts of media. So there's a huge advantage just in terms of awareness. Canadian broadcasters have become risk-averse. They have done the same thing for years. It works for them. They don't want to take the risk of doing anything else. What do the fuck do these dicks here think they're doing? Don't start any shit with them, Rick. But for the Trailer Park Boys, Risk is their brand. They created a highly successful cult TV series which ran for seven seasons. They made three feature films, two one-hour specials, and even a live stage show. We did that for five years and toured all over the world. We knew that the demand was there. People were just like, come on, we need more. Why'd you guys stop? We come up with this idea, you know, because of the way technology's going, it's like, well, why do we need a TV station? Why do we need a bunch of people telling us what, you know, what's funny? So they decided to create their own subscription web-based TV network called SwearNet. This is Pat Roach reporting for SwearNet Extreme Fucking Weather. Bringing not only new episodes of the Trailer Park Boys back to the screen, but also a new crop of unique specialty shows. It's basically an all-swearing network. There's no such thing in existence, and we feel like there should be. It has anything you'd see on a normal network, variety-wise, but everybody on every show is allowed to swear. Like, our home renovation show is going to be called My House is Fucked. Hmm. <laughs> see, I would watch that. But SwearNet quickly caught the attention of Netflix, and the gamble paid off. We recently signed a worldwide deal with Netflix. They bought all of the previous seasons, and the season we made last summer and the season we're making right now will be going up. I'm not going to stand by while some exaggerating military hotshot. We don't have to write thinking about commercial breaks. We have to worry yeah. about, you know, coming in at 22 minutes and total creative freedom. I can't believe it. We pulled it off. Thanks to SwearNet and Netflix, the whole world can get more Ricky, Julian, and Bubbles. But why would they want to get to know these bunch of Canadians? Everybody knows characters like Ricky, Julian, Bubbles, and Leahy, and Randy. They're everywhere. They're all over the world. And people say that to all, us all the time. Hey, I know a guy that's just like you, Julian. 
Or they say, hey, I'm just like you, Ricky. I'm exactly like you. And we're like, that's maybe not the best. <laughs> what he's trying to say is, you're way more important to us than the dope, man. I'm sorry. sorry. You know, if you strip away all the craziness, what you're left with is, you know, a show about these three guys who stick together and have each other's backs no matter what. And that's sort of a universal human quality that doesn't matter where you live, people can relate to. Rosh, you're coming to the Metro Center. No way. Yes, sir. Evo. There's no mistaking that the Trailer Park Boys are 100% Canadian. There was never an attempt to, you know, hide it or make it generic. And $700 Canadian tire money. Double, double decaf. Every stop I make, I make a new friend. And it's not surprising the boys liked their Canadian TV growing up. Man, when I was growing up, TV was massive. I was a TV addict. I watched everything. A lot of Canadian stuff, too. Beachcombers, seeing things. SCTV. SCTV. There's a voice. Littlest Hobo. Amazing. I still watch Littlest Hobo. When you look back over the history, for example, of Canadian television programming, that people tend to remember it's actually been the stuff that is most distinctively Canadian. Because you don't look at any of those programs and say that they were a knockoff of American programming. Interestingly enough, some of our most distinctive Canadian shows are being noticed here. Cannes, The French Riviera, Playground to the Rich and Famous, and just plain rich. Cannes may be home to the glitziest and most glamorous film festival in the world, but it also plays host to MIP TV, the world's largest international TV market, where the biggest movers and shakers come out to sell their shows to buyers from around the world. And Canada is now emerging as a significant player. Dozens of homegrown shows are catching the buyer's eyes. The Canadian contingency this year is huge, never been bigger. And you'll find a lot of the, those shows from the flashpoints to, I mean, something like Heartland sells in over 100 countries. They're out there. They want that kind of stuff that communicates uh, to everybody in the world. And John Vatcher knows all about success in selling a Canadian TV show as the executive producer of the Republic of Doyle. This homegrown hit is airing all over the world. Republic of Doyle is in India, it's in the, the UK, um, Ireland, it's in Australia, it's in Poland, Hungary. Azerbaijan is like, really? You guys have that? You're going to watch the guy jump into the GTO and go? I think we're now over 100 countries. I remember we were online and, and Alan found the first Russian dub and it floored me. I started laughing, but it was so cool. It gave you this kind of tingle you just never anticipated. Yes, you can find nearly anything online these days, and not only in Russian. Traditional broadcasters are scrambling to figure out how to make shows we will watch and still make money in this new digital world. The democratization of video, I think that's a really fundamental shift. It puts the ability in everybody's hands to tell their story. And you're starting to see some amazing things happen there. When we return, we'll find out what TV has in store for us. Hours for Canada. All those bothersome commercials. The online. The future is here. Most of our favorite shows now live in cyberspace, waiting for us to watch anytime we want, skipping by all those bothersome commercials. The online world has thrown conventional TV on its head. Broadcasters are losing advertising dollars. Networks are scrambling to find new ways to reach audiences. But if you think this new digital age means an end to advertising, think again. It's the best place for an advertiser to reach a big audience fast, and that hasn't changed. Even though the TV audience is now fragmented across multiple channels, it still gives you the best reach of any medium. If it's something important, like the Grammys or the Super Bowl or Miss America or Miss Universe, I'll watch it on a big television. And I watch football. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot about football. I watch the NFL on television. 
I got an actual TV where I can sit in front of it and watch the commercials go by. Year after year, the Super Bowl is by far the most watched sporting event on TV. And the advertisers throw big money at commercials because they know they have a captive audience. In Canada, our passion for watching hockey has got Rogers investing $5.2 billion in NHL broadcast rights, hoping it will keep our eyeballs glued to the tube and hence advertisers happy. The most used new word in the television business is eventize. We're going to eventize this show. And th th that's because it's the one way to get live viewing, is to say it's an event, you've got to watch it tonight, hook it up to social media, make people comment on it. That's a driving force now in television. And it's not just sports that broadcasters are using to keep us glued to the set. Remarkably, in the past year, NBC put on a live version of The Sound of Music, which people thought, a lot of people thought, boy, is that going to bomb? I mean, it was a huge hit, huge. It had like five times the audience that was predicted because people thought, oh, that's an event. It's a live musical. We haven't seen that in a long time. i got to see what that looks like. It looks like TV is still smart enough to borrow from its past to create its future. But make no mistake, we have changed the way we watch TV. And both programmers and advertisers are trying to figure out what it all means. To get a better price with TV, phone, and internet. And we use TV maybe 5% of the time, and we use internet nonstop. Yeah. So I think the world is changing. It's just taking a while for the cable companies to figure out how, where their place is now. And with 85,000 people cutting the traditional cable cord every year in Canada, our broadcasters must formulate a new plan in order to survive. A new subscription video on demand service is being launched in Canada. Show me. Shaw and Rogers have even come together to create their own platform called Show Me. And Rogers has also inked a hundred million dollar deal with Vice, the leading global youth media company, in hopes of capturing the coveted eyeballs of the tech savvy millennial generation. Bell Media, not to be outdone by their competitors, have also just signed a multi-year deal with HBO in an effort to piggyback on their success. Undoubtedly, the shape and size of the box to which we glue our eyes will continue to change. But the truth is, we don't know what the future holds for TV. Well, there's always, I think, going to be TV stations because there are people that have a routine and they like to flip around and happen upon things. It won't completely die, but it's going to take a, a horrific beating. We are moving more and more and more to an on-demand world. They will be screens everywhere, everything touchable, everything movable, everything available all the time. Television is evolving, is constantly changing. I think we're going to be watching television on multiple platforms. The situation a decade or 20 years from now is going to be a little different from what it is now, but not hugely so. Television is still the most powerful storytelling medium of our time and that will continue. Next week, Doc Zone heads to the mountains. If your plane goes down or you're shipwrecked, Canadian professionals